Good morning, everyone. Hello, my name is Babakar, and I'm a, I am a postdoctoral research fellow at Human Institute for Humanities in Africa at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. It is my, my great pleasure to welcome everyone to this week's ATAI seminar. Uh, the ATAI interdisciplinary seminars at Huma is open to all and is a space for nurturing um, new ideas and making connections in order to foment a radically different vision of the university. Um, for security reasons, to avoid Zoom bombing, we kindly ask the people joining us and our participants to log in on this Zoom session with their full names. Um, if not, they, they will see themselves halted in the waiting room and will not be let in until they, they do so. I would like to extend my special guest, my special welcome to our guest, Professor Kamari Maxim Clark of the University of Toronto in Canada and also um, in UCLA in the United States, who will be talking about the possibility of embodying a radical humanism in anthropology. Um, Kamari Maxim Clark is the distinguished professor of the transnational justice and social legal studies at the University of Toronto in Canada. She is also an adjunct professor at um, the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA in the United States. For more than 20 years, Professor Clark has conducted research on issues related to legal institution, human rights and international law, religious nationalism and the politics of globalization. Professor Clark is the author of nine books and other and over 60 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, including, for example, her 2009 publication of Fiction of Justice, um, the International Criminal, Criminal Court, and the Challenge of Legal Pluralism in Sub-Saharan Africa, published by Cambridge in 20, 2009, and also Affective Justice, the International Criminal Court, and the Pan-Africanist Pushback, published by Duke, in 2019, which won the finalized the, the, the final finalist prize for the American Anthropological Association's 2020 Elliot P. Skinner Book Award for the Association for Africanist Anthropology and the 2020 Royal Anthropology Institute's Amarutul Book Book Prize. Professor Clark has also been the recipient of other research and teaching awards, um, including multiple grants awards from the National Science Foundation, uh, the Social Sciences and the Humanities Research Council of, of Canada, um, the Rockefeller Foundation and Winnegrant Foundation, Foundation for Anthropological Research. Very recently, she won the recipient of the Guggenheim Award for 2021. Um, so this presentation, today she's gonna talk about, like I said, the possibility of embodying radical humanism in anthropology and the presentation examine the universalistic tradition of American anthropology and its relegation of black and indigenous bodies or lives into object of positivistic methodologies. Um, Professor Clark, thank you so much for being with us today. And if you would like, uh, please to go ahead. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh... I'm hoping that everyone can hear me okay. I've just shared my screen. Uh, thank you, uh, Bubakar, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Huma for the invitation to be with you today, as well as to Ralph Borland. And of course, Ralph was first the, the facilitator of the invitation and had to endure some rescheduling headaches with me. So thank you, of course, Ralph, uh, for, for the work uh, in, in making this possible before my travel tomorrow. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, just introduce the paper. My assumption is that everyone has read it at this point. And what I'll do is highlight some of the key points, the, the context around its writing. And if there's enough time at, at the end of my these preliminary remarks, what I'd like to do is uh, just share with you some of the, the five principles that are draft principles that are part of the collaborative work that a, a, a small group of us have been doing and that in many ways undergird the motivation for this chapter. Uh, I should also say that the, the chapter or the article that I've shared is 
a work in progress. This actually is the first version, the first draft uh, of it, and the first time I'm actually presenting or speaking to it. So I'm really looking forward to your feedback, the conversation that will ensue. And even as I was reflecting on how I wanted to frame my remarks, there are a number of things that stood out for me that I hope to be able to clarify over the course of this hour. Uh, so it, it's worth saying that and situating the, the writing of this during, of course, a global pandemic and the, the realities that uh, in the midst of the pandemic, we've been re reckoning with the realities of structural racism and structural inequality in our midst. Protest mo movements certainly are not new to us. And of course, the, the, the kind of outrage that has led to and continues to pronounce the, the tearing down of colonial statutes, uh, statues and imperial statues are, are certainly part of this moment. Uh, another part of this moment that, that this paper is writing with and against, of course, has to do with how we rethink and reconceptualize the fields within which we work and what that would look like to imagine a, a different possibility. Or do we burn it all down and, and reconceptualize what that would look like? And so this, this paper really comes out of that spirit, um, as well as rethinking the genealogies through which we map the field. And as you saw from the paper, uh, the questions of exclusions and silences uh, are, are not only part of the way that we need to rethink the field, but they are also part of the way that I'm arguing we need to, to map and methodologically what we see and what we do when we do field work, when we try to understand our social world. And so the, the, the larger context then is the interplay between radical protest uh, that is part of our world and the attempts, and I guess a dialectic attempt to reestablish social norms in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, and of course, my paper then calls for a disruption in the methodologies and the precepts that, that shape this, this social research and invite us to think differently about some of these, these challenges. Now, the, the, the pre-circulated pre paper also takes abduction as a critical method uh, toward the imagining of radical humanism in anthropology. And it opens with a set of questions and th there's no, it's no accident that the questions are about knowledge production uh, and knowledge production at the backdrop of European enlightenment, questions of universalism, the emergence of a notion of humanism, all that produced the terms on which positivism shaped um, the, the, the understanding of the human and the emergence of a notion of the human. And part of what I, um, oh, I see my slide went forward without me, so, so that's good. Um, so positivism. Uh, so part of what uh, the point of departure, of course, and as you could see in the paper, there's, uh, an important obsession with the, the traditions and those who stood outside of those positivist traditions or were in tension with them. So um, two features of positivism that are worth highlighting that came out of the paper had to do with positivism as a methodological scientism, uh, or we could see it as a belief that only sci the scientific method can produce truth. And a second primary orientation of positivism that the paper takes up has to do with the, or the reduction of knowledge production to a methodological emphasis on fieldwork praxis. And so ultimately positivism has, for our purposes in, in, as, as, scholars, um, as scholars interested in interrogating the human condition, the challenge around positivism is that it's involved the reduction of epistemology to method, and it and it has reinforced the primacy of routinized, replicable fieldwork practices for those who are interested in interrogating anthropological fieldwork. And so we see its its limbs and its um, pronouncements throughout many fields. Uh, and in anthropology, certainly in the work of Malinowski, in the work of Franz Boas uh, of the early 1900s, we see 
the, the relevance there. And what's key here with Boazian positivism has been research-driven scientific methods that, that in many ways have led to the emergence of what was often celebrated as relativist tradition. So culture-centered approaches to documenting the lives of black and indigenous peoples. And so as a, as a lineage of thought, positivism then is often understood to have originated um, in the mid 19th century. Uh, and I trace some of this genealogy in the paper, um, but, but what's key is that the, its emergence is fundamentally related to the production of a kind of Western rationality that grants those who adopt its tools the authority to make things knowable, um, to produce a broader ideology, uh, and what often happens is what gets hidden are the deep connections of and the, the forms of exclusion and epistemological constraints that that are part of the emergence and rise of positivist thought. Um, and, and of course, if one traces that genealogy, the the its alliance with and departure from religious cosmologies is is deep and relevant. Uh, and the, the the relevance of the emergence of scientific thought and scrutiny is at large. Um, and so enter humanism then in, in the paper and in, in thinking about humanism uh, as a Western philosophy conceptualized through, we might think of the, the European Renaissance of the 14th and the 17th century. Uh, and central to its emergence, of course, was the, the reckoning with reason and rationality, um, as well as dislodging theological conceptions of, of causality, causality, which we significant, we see significantly in um, Sylvia Winter's work. And so, it, so enter humanism then as celebrated as a, as a domain for uh, for fairness, for equity, and for the production of universalist principles, um, which have since, of course, by you know, significant mainstream thought as well as radical thought, um, has been criticized and debunked as, uh, or at least the celebratory part of its its relevance. And and so, um, it, instead, uh, what I guess the takeaway or the important point with humanist trajectories and with positivism was the central production of um, the way that universalism and humanism were bound together. And so the, the, the key argument from the paper then is that the reality is that we need to abandon these presumptions. Um, and that's a given and, and that's not new certainly. Uh, part of what the paper does, though, is to detail the, the, the politics of completion and finality and knowability that have formed the basis of these forms of cultural anthropological thought, and instead to replace it with conceptual tools that speak to the reality that knowledge is actually partial and never fully achievable. Uh, under very few grounds can we documented as achievable and not only that but the 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 idea of the all-knowing subject the neoliberal all-knowing subject that can be documented and known um, is fundamentally a, a fiction and in in thinking about the nature of the fiction we um, have to contend with the the realities of subjectivity as a mode of belonging of becoming sorry as a mode of becoming uh, that um, and that the, the idea of the incomplete nature of knowing uh, shouldn't be failed as framed as a failure, but instead it should be understood as the, uh, the reality of a social condition, the multiplicity of life, the, the complexity of knowledge, uh, and that, that that becomes the starting point, not the, the end point or the basis for critique. Um, and so that's really part of the central mission that that the paper takes on and uh, highlights what new conceptual tools might be necessary to appreciate these divergences as well as these multiplicities. Uh, I ask uh, 
to what extent might we reimagine anthropology by telling the story of the discipline, not simply through those hegemonically aligned with the rise of positivism and the emergence of science of the, the discipline, but instead through those methods and commitments rendered marginal by such processes. And this is really where the, the story begins um, in, in the paper. And uh, let me just fast forward the slide. Um, so this is where the story begins, and the story begins, of course, with uh, uh, abduction as a conceptual tool for thinking about and thinking against methodological scientism and inst insisting, um, which, of course, insists that truth is strictly in the purview of science. And instead, what we see is abduction is a mode of understanding it foregrounds becoming as a, a form of, of reasoning. Um, there are forms of embodiment that and affects and precarities of daily life that are part of this notion of ab abduction. Uh, also part of the tenets of ab abduction, as you saw in the paper, is the anti-empirical basis on which um, it's presented. Uh, it's, it's based on overlapping forms of partiality as well as instead of observable totality, as I show here in the slide. And what, what it's writing against then is, is, oh yes, so this next slide is really abduction is about telling a different story. Um, it's a method of forming a general prediction without a positive assurance that it will succeed. Uh, so the idea of suspension and, and not certainty uh, is both the starting place and the end place of the anthropo of this kind of uh, inquiry. Uh, and, and of course that departs from some of the positivist principles around inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning, which uh, we see in the next slide. Um, because it's, it's important here, it's in the paper, but just to tease out um, what one of the key, the key distinctions here in thinking about the utility of abduction. And so with inductive reasoning, of course, there are often, and many actually see inductive reasoning as the best that we have in anthropological work or in this pseudo humanistic science um, uh, and of course, inductive reasoning starts from derivable or deriving generalized features from uh, observation. So you go to the field without uh, a given set of um, a given hypothesis necessarily, or a given set of assumptions or categories, and from there, one uses the categories of those um, who are who one encounters. And it's those categories that then shape the basis for inquiry and, and, and that then people using it, inductive processes attribute causality and predictions uh, from the categories that emerge from those encounters. And so, of course, many would celebrate inductive reasoning in this way. Um, it's, it's quite, or turn to deductive re reasoning, which is, often um, seen as far more pro problematic than inductive reasoning. But the, the challenge with inductive and deductive reasoning is the presumption that there exists a knowable subject, uh, a knowable subject that can be understood, that can be studied, uh, who has a beginning and an end, um, who, whose fluctuations and contradictions just need to be teased out through the production of data. Um, and that it, in which knowledge production still emerges from that encounter. And, and part of what we are saying in relation to abduction is that the, the kind of certainty that derives from those methodological processes all necessarily depend on a knowable object of, of inquiry. Uh, and so in part, the, 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 in, the invitation here as a works in progress is really um, to think about abduction and, and what we get then from a methodological process that doesn't presume knowability and that actually um, doesn't require certainty as the way to achieve understanding and that, that abandons truth even as, uh, as what is achieved from the methodological process. 
And, and instead, and I'm just going to advance the slide, instead what um, abduction and uh, the, the call for critical radical humanism offers us is an ethics and politics of attachment, uh, as well as, as you saw in the paper, new genealogies for thinking through those new politics of attachment. Uh, and and what I do then through the paper is to think through Ella Cara Deloria and Zora Neale Hurston as both marginal figures in anthropology's canon, but if we flip it around and make them central to the, the canon or get rid of the canon altogether and, and, and talk about what anthropology would look like if we retell the story of the 20th century through their lives and their writings as well as their exclusions, it raises a whole set of other implications for what we know ab about the 20th century, the, 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 the emergence of the field, of the discipline, as well as the, the assumptions that we have uh, about what, what is relevant and what the priorities should be. So, so here we have Zora and Ella, um, Cara Deloria, of course, these are, um, these are quotes that are drawn from from the text. Uh, I'm just going to read for a moment uh, one of them from Barracoon that that uh, came out of Zora's piece, uh, and I love this actually because this is a, a wonderful indication of the vulnerability of the researcher, where um, Zora is Kosula pushes back and says. Um, where is the house? So he's, of course, speaking in his dialect and says, where is the house where the mouse is the leader? In Africa, um, in the Africa soil, I can't tell you about the son before I tell you about the father. And therefore, you understand me. I can't talk about the man who is the father till I tell you about the man who is father to him. Now, does that he says now that right ain't it and and of course this is the this parable or the the story through which the the mythic the the kind of the imagery of the the mouse in the house being the leader of the house of course is laughable um but i think why this is wonderful is that zora as a researcher uh, arrived and she initially wanted to ask Kosala about himself and his his life, and of course he insisted that, you know, as a matter of principle, he cannot even begin talking about himself without talking about the man that birthed him, the father, the fatherland, the African context in which he he arrived in in Alabama, and uh, and and the willingness of Zora Neale Hurston to be vulnerable and to foreground the error as well as the the conceptual problematic that was part of the the research is part of the adaptive process that that uh, Zora certainly um, advances in in her work um, the and and this is a methodological question as well but I think it's an interesting one and and the book of course if you haven't read it uh, if you have read it you you've seen how precious and um, complex and interesting the text is. And of course, we saw that Zora refuses to uh, interpret um, or transcribe in, in English. She insists on using the vernacular uh, and Kasala's words to, to, and keeping them in, in, as integral to the text as possible, which is why her text was never published by the publishers who wanted to market it for an audience that could um, could understand it easily without having to work too hard. And you saw how I struggled in, in, in reading it as well, but part of it is um, to, to keep it not in its authentic self, but at least to represent Zora's rendition of, of his vernacular here. Um, the same is true, as you saw in the, the text, the second half in Ella, De, Ella Cara Deloria's work. Um, and the excerpt that I include here, we see a lot of agony um, in Ella's writing. And like Zora's work, her text was never published either. Um, and, and what you saw in the, in the paper was really a, a, her laments around 
how she can be true to the people who are part of her constituency, her family, her life, and at the same time do anthropological work. And she was never able to reconcile that. She was too, too Indian for the Indian, you know, using her words and not Indian enough, quote, um, for, uh, you know, government officials, et cetera, who wanted to represent uh, First Nations, Aboriginal life. And so, so the, the excerpt that I show here, she's speaking here to Ruth Benedict and she says, Ruth, it's just awful. I simply cannot write as a real investigator hitting the high points and drawing uh, conclusions. There is too much I know. I made a hundred false starts and I and can't tell you how much I've torn up my manuscript and begun again. I think the most you can say for it is that it's a composite of data information and that I am the glorified native mouthpiece. And so this reckoning with her place as a mouthpiece, but the reality that not only can she not write and, and represent in a positivist tradition that Franz Boas, her teacher, her, inter, her, her colleague expects, uh, but that the, the text that she produces is in fact a composite. It, it, it in no way represents reality. It in no way can ever because the framing, the framing devices don't allow it. And, and so in, in many ways, abduction then uh, as a, um, as a as an invitation to making or rendering the 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 challenges with frameworks that often render illegitimate the the work and life and words of people with whom we work um, it is is in fact an invitation uh, and the goal is connectivity not detachment of the uh, positive tradition and and of course, connectivity as a mode of ethical engagement, which amplifies people's own frameworks um, and, uh, and produces the, the, the possibility of reckoning with their knowing, which can be very far from someone else's knowing, but that the ultimate objective isn't just that. Okay, so I, I have to move along very quickly uh, because not only do I need to wrap up this summary, but I have a webinar in half an hour uh, on another, um, in another context. So um, just very quickly then, uh, and then I'll, we'll open up for questions and comments, I'm, and I'm welcoming those. It's the, the invitation at the end of the paper, which is an invitation toward um, radical humanism and possibilities for uh, framing differently or, or, or principles around which we can think about uh, a, a, a different field of possibilities. And um, just to share right at the end here, um, the some of the draft principles that we've been working through in advancing radical humanism, um, these, these five are the, the draft principles. And in fact, they, they emerged from sets of conversations that we've been having in, in the US with colleagues as well as uh, colleagues elsewhere outside of the US and Canada and Brazil and in African contexts and in the Caribbean and in, in India, et cetera, who are part of this growing initiative, which is to identify if we don't burn down the house, if, if anthropology and the tools, the positivist tools that continue to be latent in our toolkits uh, will not be burned down, <laughs> you know, using uh, Brian Jobson's uh, configuration of whether we should let it burn, uh, what would replace it? And are there new draft principles that, that would emerge as key principles around which we organize our work? And th this is a very preliminary list that Deborah Thomas and I and um, a, a number of students in a number of places uh, in the US and in Canada have been advancing uh, and the second of which, so the, the draft principle one, it articulates humanism, um, what or what an, an anthropological humanism would look like, and of course, as I've said earlier, it's it's the rethinking of the liberal subjects, but also the the liberal subject that is stable and knowable and reducible to cultural units, and and data. Uh, 
the, the second principle is the, the principle of, a, of attunement, but this is where abduction comes in. And this is really at the heart of the, the paper. Um, draft principle three, of course, has to do with centering lived experience rather than quanti the quantification of uh, big data and algorithmic solutions. And, you know, we could certainly have a conversation about that. And, and we are having the, these conversations about the, 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 the relationship between big data and the positivist traditions that, that um, drive it and the use for such forms of data. And at the same time, the, the place of attunement with lived experience. Uh, and then the last two principles, uh, multi-scalar analysis and thinking about uh, how we go in and out and how we scale up and down the, the, the engagements that we have uh, in the field with those who are interlocutors. Um, and, and then the, the fifth having to do with collaborative knowledge production. And in fact, the webinar that I'm going to in 25 minutes is, is actually about that. It's about, it's, it uses the frame of extractivism and the problem around extractive knowledge production uh, in the field. And so just to end then, it's draft principle two, uh, which I'll end with, um, is the optic for the paper. Uh, a commitment to, to a method of relational and multimodal attunement. And this commitment presumes a mode of reasoning through abduction, an approach that does not begin with the reassurance of truth as we saw in the paper, but instead it amplifies people's own theoretical frames and accepts a future of unanticipated effects. So I will uh, stop it on that note and open, we'll open the floor and I'll turn it back over to uh, Bubakar, thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Clark, for this um, uh, very interesting um, uh, presentation. Um, I, I myself, I was really interested in the paper and um, I did not read the paper from an anthropological point of view, because like I said, um, Ataya is a space which is um, very interdisciplinary. Um, yeah. I, I, read the, I read the paper uh, from the perspective of, of someone who is really interested in American culture studies, you know? uh, because uh, and and the uh, and, uh, and the novel and, and the book *The Raccoon*. When I, when I read the, the, the book, for example, uh, it it reminds me of the, for example, the evolution of the discipline. For example, going from American studies to American culture studies, and between. Um, and the life of Zora Huston herself and, and the, her relationship with, with Kosolo um, epitomizes the evolution of the, of the study itself. And um, to, 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 to some point, I, I want to emphasize that I, I have mentioned, I, I have written some notes because the presentation itself is, uh, sits at the crossroads of literature, history, and orality in debunking the verticality of the research object relationship. So Barakun is, like I said, is very interesting because it it tells us to go back to to consider, for example, um, African history because sometimes you know um, uh, the, the 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 last survivor is telling a very interesting um, 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 very interesting history. We have to reconsider the way the, the slave trade has been epitomized in 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 African in African American literatures. You know, we have to we have to consider the participation of. Of African kingdoms as well, and it's very important to me. And also the the, the notion of language, the novel itself is written in a vernacular language. So if you want to understand, you know, the lives of Kosoli, you have to be perseverant, you know, because uh, Huston herself want, didn't want to translate the, the, the you know the the, inter, the the documentation into English. So I I, I, I wanted also to 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 mention the fact that. Uh, Herson herself also was was recruited as a collector, not as an interpreter of African American culture, and that's very important. And at the time when she was working under an, uh, and working and funded by white patronage, so um, just to, 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 just to you know ask you a very simple question: uh, Don't you think that um, is there any evolution um, as anthropology? Anthropologists of color, for example, Africans who are working, for example, who need money funding to do their, their work. Um, isn't it something that is really um, replicable today? Uh, are we still having those problems where more often than not, you know, 
an anthropologists you know of color are still um having the dilemmas of um working under such white potential for example because as i seen you know we we, we have been um um uh, you know um, we have been talking about funding and money so is it is it still difficult for, for anthropologists of color to you know to to get access to funding and to work the way they should want it to work for example yes great Th thank you babakar and uh i i started smiling as you were asking that question and thought of my my colleagues who call it donor dancing uh, in fact, and when Divine earlier talked about, uh, anyway, we, we, I won't get into that with because we don't have enough time on, uh, with my conversation with Divine, but Absolutely. yes, indeed, I think you've hit it right on the head that, mm -hmm. that the political economy of academic production is, is critical for us to understand and make sense of. Um, mm -hmm. So in Zora Neale Hurston's case, of, of course, she had a philanthropist who supported her work and, and set the terms, Franz Boas and, and others, in fact, commissioned her to collect work uh, for their purposes. And the idea was the documentation, not mm -hmm. necessarily the an analysis. And as you've said very nicely, she wasn't an interpreter of those traditions. Uh, but she also, and I think this is what's brilliant about what she did within the constraints, mm -hmm. She, she also used humor, and I talk about that a little bit in the paper, and used subversion and um, uh, ways of turning things upside down that weren't e easily seen or understood by uh, her white patrons, in fact, including Boaz. And she was able to be very sugary with Franz Boaz when she needed to be, and, and other times quite duplicitous. Uh, and both in her actions as and in the ways that she documented the role of tricksters in um, Caribbean and, and American imaginaries. So I think that that's absolutely the case in the contemporary period as well, that there are ways that scholars of color, um, you know, are constrained in, in a whole range of ways, both in the collaborative work that we do, uh, mm -hmm. as well as the, the collaborative work that we do with others. There are things we can't write, we can't publish, mm -hmm. but there are also constraints with um, the, you know, what the production might be. Uh, but, but I think that there are also ways that, that scholars are able to separate themselves from um, those requirements of funding agencies, etc. And for those at elite schools, for example, that have other access to resources with no strings attached, there are ways to deploy and use research methods that, um, that enable far more freedom and liberties. Um, it's not always the case, and it's, it's, it's not only the case, uh, but there are a whole range of other ways that people also use their personal money to, to support projects or they win an award, which you know certainly was in my case and used some of those funds to advance a particular mission that was in the interest of the, the kind of work that I'm doing. So I think there are a range of ways that contemporary scholars continue to, to do that. And we are seeing a continuity. So thanks for, for raising that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, now. I I'm going to open the floor to to, to people if you um, if you have a few comments and questions because we have 20 minutes. I saw Dominic Dominic is uh, Dominic's hands. Dominic, if you would like to to go ahead. Yes, thank you so much for this amazing methodological uh, proposition for us for anthropologists. I I I um, I have written a little paper a few years ago when Barakun was translated in in French, and I particularly wanted to, to write about this in French and to French anthropologists because for uh, anthropologists in color, France, the question of the distance is particularly uh, problematic. Um, you can't be too close, you can't be too far. You can't, you can't write about the people you are uh, from, but you can't also uh, write about people who are different from you because that kind of oddness seems to be reserved um, to white anthropologists. <laughs> But one question that I wanted to ask, because I've read, uh, for the purpose of that paper, I've read the translation of Barakun in French. And I wanted to ask the question of the translation of the, the kind of anthropology that you are you know, calling for and you know, uh, anticipating. Um, the, the translation in Barakun is in French is quite, 
problematic. Like the so uh, there's, there's uh, as far as I remember, there's a few passages from Kostula that, or in I think in Yoruba or um, uh, Fon, I think it's in Yoruba. But but this like mo most of most of it is in vernacular, and what what is uh, what the French translator chose to translate that. Um, is uh, what we call in, Fran in French petit nègre, which is very, <laughs> a very derogatory word to, uh, to, 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 uh, to describe the way uh, the, the, the uh, soldiers in the French army, like the colonial soldiers, were speaking French. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, that's what was chosen, so very uh, limited um, problematic knowledge that was a result of linguistic hegemony. Um, so, in like the, the effort that that uh, uh, Erston is making to to use this language to 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 to, um, to to kind of like to express this uh, the, the the proximity and mm -hmm. to and to to also reflect the the affect of of this um, rapport that she's building with Kosula, like the French translation <laughs> transform that into like the most um, colonial of of you know possible relationships. So yeah, I, I like reading your reading your article and hearing you today. I was thinking of that. How do we translate that kind of anthropology that is not constructing um, others as objects, but with the translation <laughs> kind of, you know, um, set us back. So yeah, that was my question. Thank you, Don. Mm -hmm. Shall we take a couple of them or should I? Uh... Yes, I think we can take a, a couple of them and then you can just um, okay. respond to the global. Um, I see um, uh, my colleague Ralph hands up. Ralph? Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Kamari. Um, I just wanted to, to say thank you for introducing the concept of abduction to me, uh, because um, I'm, I'm really attracted as I come from a fine arts background, and I'm attracted to ideas of methods which are related to real experience. And so, you know, there are all of those terms like autoethnography or action research or grounded, you know, research, which are seem to be giving validation to ways of doing things that might also just seem to us to be a sensible uh, way of doing them. So I liked, uh, I liked in a general sense, your outlining of abduction as something that relates to a real world way of knowing the world and of uh, doing research. So yeah, that's just a broad comment. Thank you for that. Thanks, Ralph. Is there any other question before we, we hand back the floor to Professor Clark? If not, if also you could also write the, your question in the chat and then I will come back to that. Um, yes, Professor, if you would like to go ahead. Yeah, sure. Thank you for those uh, comments and questions. So the so I guess it's Dominique's. Uh, thank you so much for raising that. I, I didn't read uh, um, Barracoon in French, uh, only the English version. And I've never heard that critique, in fact, how bad the, the English translation, the, the French translation is. And it's, it's very sad that that's the case, in fact, because Hurston refused to publish it on terms that weren't acceptable to her. And in fact, you know, the, the paradox is that here we have a derogatory concepts that that are derogatory that that in fact um, undermine the very spirit around which her work was was written so that that's interesting and that's something to continue to to think about and i will look at the french version uh, mm -hmm. now that you flagged that uh, i think that but the larger question that you've raised in relation to the this point about bad translation is a question about translation in general um, and translation as replica and the inability to ever achieve completion or um, a appropriate replacements of concepts and words, uh, not only through, you know, from vernacular to other language forms, but uh, that, that the translation itself is fraught and can never be seen as a replacement. Um, 
and and even the experience of uttering something like in this conversation what i'm saying you're translating it based on your own life world your imaginary etc and that too is a form of transposition that that produces new things and things that i haven't even um, intended but that come to you and are interpreted in the ways that are based on your own knowledge trajectory. And so this, this question and challenge around translation, both in its commercial and outrageous forms, but also the problem of translation, I think continues to be a challenge for us in, in the contemporary moment, um, just as it was in the past. Uh, what's, what I think what the, the translation dilemma um, raises is the need for us to continue to be vigilant in how we think about knowledge production. Uh, there's a wonderful place, and I'll move on to the next point, but let me just end, end the, this response by saying there's a wonderful place in the text in Barakun where, where Kasula makes clear that he arrived on a plantation, in a plantation context where people did not speak the same language. Okay. Right, so the idea that the enslaved were made, were captives and next to each other, some from Dahomey, some from this region, that region, um, and that they're next to each other and working on plantations together, they're in engaging with each other and having to figure out how to communicate with each other as well as those who are enslaving them. And so there's an, I think language and translation and complexity certainly are at the center of the text. And, and I think that's why it's so critical to continue to think about how futile the, the positive tradition is that then tries to, to flatten it and produce numeric values out of these things that are far more complex than, than we can understand through these forms of quantification. So, um, so thank you for that question. And, and then Ralph, um, I, I didn't realize you were in fine arts. So, and in fact, I really have to tip my hat to, and I'm humbled by the, the, the work of scholars in the arts and artists in general, and the ability to see and to, to see life between the notes and between the lines and to, to think about art forms, to think about parables, to think about these other domains in which life is actually lived. It's often not the, the solid categories that are products of modernity, but instead it's, it's, you know, it's the, the complexities, it's the seeing, the hearing, the feeling, the, the expression. Um, it's not sometimes what is said, but how it's said, how it sounds. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm glad that you've, you find it useful. And, and I think many of us who were trained in the social sciences, or in my case, also in law, um, it has been a, a learning curve to, to abandon the, the formulations and the categories that so predominated our our knowledge production and the, the way that we evaluate and, and instead to, to suspend it and, and take seriously other things, including parables as, as, as theory-making domains. So, so thanks for that point, uh, uh, Ralph. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Clark, for the for the for the for the responses. Um, I think also it, it makes me feel that say something which is kind of making connection about about the paper and something. Um, it it made me think of Edouard Glissant's um practice of relations when he's talking about uh, the right to opacity, for example. We should not we should be okay um to not knowing fully. I mean the other and. And which also something related to Francis Nyamjo's idea of incompleteness yes. as as currency to conviviality. So I think, I'm, and that was really epitomized by uh, Hurston uh, herself with with Kosolo. Um, there is a, a question in the chat by Divine. Um, he is asking whether uh, can anthropology is can anthropology capable of attaining this radical humanism? Or it is just a, a, an ideal we should uh, aspire, uh, we should aspire for uh, something, something to make us feel good, especially given, despite um, uh, its commitment to reflexivity, uh, that it constantly, constantly find itself in one crisis after the other. 
Uh, great. Thank you, Divine. Um, yes, of, of course, this is the, the difficult question. And this is really where the paper begins with Brian Jobson's call for radical humanism, but also with the question about whether we should let anthropology burn. Not that we are burning anthropology, but we let it burn itself as it implodes, as, as we continue to reckon with the, the challenges, with the tools, the inheritance, the traditions that are part of its making. Um, and anthropology, you know, we can replace it with other things, with sociology, with, you know, other fields in our discipline to, to think about what are the tools for knowledge production? Do they, you know, is there a capacity to, to recognize other forms of theory making or trace other genealogies that, that allow us to, to make sense of human history? Uh, and so to Divine's question, is this just aspirational or is, is, is it possible? I, 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 I want to believe that, that it is and that, that some change will be possible in our lifetime. Um, but, but change sometimes happens with aspiration, with articulations, with itemizing and thinking through comprehensively and identifying with precision what the, 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 the problem is. What are the conceptual problems? What are the methodological problems? Uh, what are the, the alternatives? Uh, what do we lose? What do we gain? How do we rethink the, a, a given trajectory? Um, one of the challenges, and we've been doing this work with the Wenner Grand Foundation. So Deb Thomas and I, we've, um, we've been doing some uh, trainings for public writing, but also webinars and um, putting together a syllabus repository. Because one of the problems, of course, is that many of us have been trained in a particular canonical tradition. Uh, you know, we get our degrees from these schools, we uh, write grants, our work has to be legible in, to others who are part of the, you know, review committees, etc. Uh, and, and probably at, in the early stage of our careers, many of us probably were believers. We, you know, we read Marx and, you know, Gramsci and Foucault diligently. We knew Foucault more than Foucault, other Foucaultian um, thinkers, etc. cetera, um, only to, to, to reckon with the ongoing exclusions that are part of the, the trajectories and, and to identify precisely how those exclusions happen through our training modalities, through the syllabi that we construct. And what does it take then to debunk that, to in insist that faculty who are teaching core courses include syllabi that represent, not just represent in its plurality, you know, people from all over the world, but conceptually are, have frameworks that allow us to think about theory making and theory building in a range of places using a range of forms and modalities and with their complexity. The challenge for Divine's question and the response is that unless we interrupt those who are doing the training and also provide the tools for retraining. So in the sense that, you know, the, those who are following a European trajectory and mapping out a Euro-American trajectory and mapping out the history of anthropology need to be retrained in the same way that they send trainers all over the world to retrain them, you know, with NGOs, et cetera. And that there need to, need to be demands that that happen as well as facilities to make that happen. The capacity to have a sabbatical leave to, to read and to rethink. There's nothing worse than claiming expertise in a subject and then not, and not feeling comfortable to teach a new, um, you know, a new area of, of the, so for example, the Boazian tradition, how do we rethink and retell that story? Um, and, and many who have PhDs and are esteemed professors uh, aren't willing to be subject to that demand that they then go into a ter terrain that is unfamiliar to them. And so there's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done and, and around funding agencies, around training, around the, around the politics of the syllabus, uh, around how we write, what we write, who we cite, uh, the nature of knowledge extraction, all of these things are, are key to the ways that we can refashion the, the field. Uh, 
uh, and it, it will take work. And so the, the work that we're doing around radical humanism and <laughs> thinking about the human and the more than human really are, are attempts to, to take up some of that work and to build coalitions with others who are doing that work. And in fact, the, the, what, the big workshop that we have coming up is in Cape Town uh, next December. And so Divine knows about that. So we look forward to um, continuing that work and being in collaboration with others as we think about the principles and, and think about what it would take. Uh, so on that note, I'll turn it back over to Babakar and to uh, Divine and Ralph. Thank you. Thank you so thank you so much, Professor. There is also a comment, very interesting comment by Vanessa. Uh, she says, Prof, it sounds to me that you are calling for us to be uh, the change we want to see. And a place to begin with that project is to recognize that we are all caught in caught up in, in what we propel. Retaining certainly um needs to take place. And this this requires serious intellectual humility. I think um, you know, um uh, she, 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 it, it, it's very important to, to talk about the community. Um, we are two minutes to the end to this session. Um, thank you so much, Professor, for coming to 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 attire and entertain, entertaining us to the radical humanism that you see possible in anthropology. Um, uh, we are really pleased to to have you today, um, and it was a, a great uh, pleasure. Um, next week's seminar is uh, about the introduction to post normal. Normal Times by Ziadin Sardar, and it, this hopefully is going to be a very interesting also seminar to come. Um, um, so without Professor, again, you you have another commitment. We, we thank you so much for your av availability and looking forward for greater, greater talk. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. <laughs>